Welcome back to Weekly Briefing. An expert witness testified to the Wisconsin Assembly regarding irregularities in the 2020 election. The hearing confirmed that over 200,000 people voted as indefinitely confined, meaning they don't have to show voter ID. It also revealed that more than 25,000 voters had application dates after Election Day, but were marked as having voted. Why are there 26,259 active voters who voted in November, but they have application dates after November 4th, 2020? We're not talking about merges back 15 years ago now. We're talking about recent, very recent history. Chris, we're talking about at least tens of thousands, likely hundreds of thousands of votes, at the very least squishy. Is Wisconsin and likely other states intentionally keeping their voter rolls squishy? Yeah, they are. What, the voter rolls are key, and the fact that there's twice as many people registered to vote in Wisconsin that are actually live there is just an example of how crazy it is. When you have dirty voter rolls, you open up the election to all kinds of potential mischief. I'm not saying necessarily the F word, where it's fraud, but there's, there's opportunity for misconduct, for irregularities, for double dealing. And that is a critical problem in Wisconsin. Judicial Watch has successfully litigated in about eight different states to force voter rolls to be cleaned up. Wisconsin is a prime candidate. And it's interesting because I think Wisconsin is actually opening the door because we have some success there. I think other states are starting to see what Wisconsin is finding and hopefully it, it cracks open the door. First. Dirty voter so. rolls, dirty election. Yeah, yeah. Ex absolutely. Mm -hmm. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson announced that the UK would end its countrywide mask mandate along with its mandatory COVID vaccine passports. The government will no longer mandate the wearing of face masks anywhere. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, from from tomorrow, from tomorrow, we will no longer require face masks in classrooms and the department. Andrew, can we hope to see something like that here in the U.S.? Maybe, but um, just to put this in context, you have to remember that Boris Johnson is incredibly unpopular right now with his own party, and there's a growing movement to uh, remove him from power. So this is plain politics, but it is plain politics that will inure to the benefit of the uh, British uh, uh, people. So. Um, yeah, can we expect the same thing here? Maybe, but I would not hold your breath before uh, January of next year. I think it'll be interesting to see how it plays out in the UK, it, you know, a little bit smaller scale, but I certainly would like to see something like that happen and here. You're, you're absolutely right. What we need to see is how this is going to be uh, executed. Is it going to be toothless, uh, just a, an edict, but then with nothing backing it up? Or will there be uh, steps taken to ensure that even private entities and other and governmental organizations um, like schools and, and whatnot cannot uh, continue at their own discretion enforcing these mandates? Right. It'll be interesting to see how it plays out. Meanwhile, a Rasmussen poll reveals that Democrats in our country want the exact opposite of what the UK is doing. The survey found that 59% of Democratic voters would support the government confining unvaccinated people to their homes. The survey also shows nearly half of Democrat voters think that the government should be able to fine or imprison people who question the efficacy of the COVID vaccines on social media, TV, or online. Demetrius, this is communism, is it not? You know, for a political movement that prides itself on being pro-choice and, and also prides itself on civil rights, um, this is a callous posture um, towards those who have different views than they have. Right. Uh, very reminiscent of uh, the fight for, for civil rights um, against those who felt oppressed and discriminated against. This is all about control, and this is all about populating fear amongst the masses of people so that this movement can exert their political dominance over them. This is not about science. This is not about health. This is strictly about control. And I believe that there is this awakening among Americans right now that are saying, you know what, enough is enough. We're not going to tolerate these useless mandates. We're not going to tolerate 
um, this useless posture towards us. And I think people are fighting back. Chris, do you think we should be confining the unvaccinated to concentration camps? Yeah, that kind of mentality, uh, just do the intellectual honesty test and flip it around the other direction and find some issue that the folks on the right feel very strongly about and say that you wish to impose the same sorts of measures on your political opponents in the opposite direction and watch the revulsion, watch the hysteria, watch the claims of, uh, you know, authoritarianism. This is fascist thinking. And if those numbers are accurate, the country is in very dangerous position. Right. Well, the numbers, it's, it's half of Democrats, which is one third. So it's like 15 percent, which it's, it's the crazy it's, extreme. It's, it's, it's creepy and it's dangerous. But what it does, though, is it reveals how deeply infected the yeah. Democrat right. Party is with authoritarian ideals. Right. And, and I think that has been a multi-decade project. <sighs> that um, has been quite successful, and we're seeing the fruits of that. Yeah, right I now. think that's right. And I also think it goes to show how Democrats are willing to just accept whatever they hear. Their fundamental ideology is one of control that's and right. suppression of freedom of thought. Unfortunately, I found that working in Washington, D.C. I didn't know that. Right. They tout inclusivity, diversity, and rights. They don't believe in those things, only as far as it will bring them control or power. I, I think you're exactly right. All right, it is time for the lightning round. Here we have now two minutes to give the panelists each 10 seconds to answer and get through as many questions as possible. We'll start with Andrew. Did Biden's press conference effectively end his presidency? His presidency has been over for a very long time. I agree. Likewise. Yes, I think it took it that little extra step over the edge. I concur with my colleagues. It's been over for a while. Okay, very good. Senator Kennedy of Louisiana said, if aliens came to Earth and said, take me to your leader, it would be embarrassing to bring them to Joe Biden. Who would you take them to? President Donald J. Trump. Yep. I think we could head south to Florida and find somebody. <laughs> well, to Chris Farrell, of course, after to Chris Donald Farrell. J. Trump. <laughs> <laughs> the Americans who have um, been awakened um, by government control and are exerting their voice. All right. We're one year into the Biden administration. What has been the highlight? Afghanistan. Yep. There is none. It's been dismal. The only highlight that I can think of is that there's one year behind us. <laughs> but there's three more. Right. Youngkin's um, winning uh, a governor election in Virginia because it's given conservatives a new model to look forward I to. I think that's a good point. What question would you ask Joe Biden at a press conference? <laughs> <laughs> Are you willing to turn off your teleprompter? Okay. My response is unerrable. <laughs> okay. I, I wouldn't ask him anything because I would either get a response that was uh, you, not coherent or that was gaslighting. Right. What happened to the unity that you promised as a candidate? Right. I'd like to know who's actually running the White House. But uh, yeah. don't go anywhere. When we come back from the break, we'll cover which topics our panel thought was important. We will be right back.